Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar, Understanding Fecal Coliforms and E. coli Testing Methods for Wastewater in Arkansas. I'm your moderator, Nancy Leonard from IDEX Water Microbiology. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the webinar. You can use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen and type in your questions. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible, but if we run out of time and you still have questions, or if you're watching this as an on-demand viewer, you may submit your questions to water at idex.com. This webinar is being recorded, and the link with the recording will be emailed to everyone who registered along with a copy of the slides. This webinar will introduce you to indicator bacteria, review the enzymatic test methods for wastewater, quality control, QA, and QC, and discuss specific wastewater regulations for the state of Arkansas. I'm happy to introduce our speakers today. Our North American Regulatory Affairs Associate, Jody Freimeyer, will be walking you through the specific wastewater regulations for the state of Arkansas. Jody received her undergraduate degree in preclinical naturopathic medicine from Johnson State College in Vermont and is currently studying at the University of Nevada to earn her master's degree in public health. She has been part of our water business for five years and works with a variety of regulatory agencies to help obtain regulatory approvals for IDEX methods. She also participates in several standards organizations, including the NELAC Institute and ASTM. Before we get to the regulations that affect your state, please join me in welcoming Sean Dubois. Sean has a BA in biology and a BS in environmental science with a concentration in marine biology and marine ecology. Sean has been a part of the water business for 17 years, working in research and development and in his current role managing the product support group. Welcome, Sean. Hi, Nancy. Thank you very much. So today we're going to talk about um, fecal coliforms, uh, E. coli, and other indicators for contamination in water. To start off, um, I'd like to go a little bit over um, indicator bacteria, indicator organisms. And basically, this comes down to the simple fact of why look for fire when you can look for smoke, something that's easy to look for. So when it comes to contaminated waters, there's a great possibility there's going to be a wide variety of pathogens that could be present. Um, to be able to look for those pathogens would be extremely time-consuming, expensive, and uh, not very easy. So in order to get away from that, what we do is we look for um, indicator organisms, those kind of things that would be easy to find um, in contaminated waters. So what exactly are the requirements for an indicator organism? Um, so of course, since we're using these indicators as a means of knowing if a pathogen is present, um, they should be present when the pathogens would be present. Uh, it, Firstly, they would be absent um, if there were no uh, contamination in the water. So they should be there when there is a contamination and should be absent in uh, non-contamination. Uh, they should be present in high numbers, then, especially considering one of the pathogens. We want something that will be re readily available to find uh, and uh, easy to see. They should be able to survive better in waters as opposed to a pathogen. Basically, we want to have something that will be in the system long enough so that way we can continue looking for it uh, even after the pathogens might no longer be present. Uh, of course, what we want is something also as easy and safe to analyze. A lot of pathogens that could be present in contaminated waters might not be safe to handle in most laboratory situations. So we want to be able to have something that would be easy to find and also safe for people to look for. Of course, we also want something that would give us a quick result. Um, the whole point of looking for a contamination event is to make sure we can ready, you know, um, fix the problem as soon as we can. So uh, bacteria that we want to look for should be easy to find and give quick results. <clears throat> of course, we also want something that's inexpensive. A lot of the tests that would be required to look for the uh, large variety of contaminants that could be in the system um, would be really expensive, so we want something that would be on the the lower cost side. And of course, finally, we want something that's going to be accurate in the look for. We want to be able to find something that's easy and always get the right results um, when we do the testing. So 
one of the best indicators for a fecal contamination event uh, would actually be E. coli. E. coli is a main inhabitant for um, many warm-blooded animals, including, of course, humans um, and birds and other, other mammals. Um, and when it's shed from the body, it's in very high numbers. So right there, we click off a couple of things um, on what makes a good indicator organism, something that we'd be able to find in high numbers and something that actually would come from a contamination event. Um, in addition, this bacteria doesn't occur naturally in the environment. It's just not out there. It has to come from a fecal source. And so therefore, if you're going to find this organism, it is because there was a fecal contamination. Um, some other little things about E. coli, it's a gram-negative bacteria and it's thermotolerant, so it's able to survive at um, elevated temperatures for the most part. So when it comes to looking for indicator organisms, E. coli is probably one of the best ones that we can look for. Uh, e. coli belongs to a, a larger group of bacteria known as uh, the total coliform group. And the total coliform group includes other uh, genus of bacteria, including um, Klebsiella, Citrobacters, Enterobacters. Um, all of these bacteria make up the group of total coliforms. These bacteria are able to survive at um, and grow really well at, of course, body temperature, which makes sense, um, about 35 degrees Celsius. Now, within the total coliform group, there is a, a subset um, of this group uh, that is in, called fecal coliforms. So it's believed that um, these bacteria, which um, are tested at 44 and a half degrees and able to survive, um, are a best indicator for fecal contamination. It removes all of the um, the issues that could occur. Um, sorry. Um, so for fecal coliforms, uh, the test is run at 44 and a half degrees. Uh, in order to try to uh, find only bacteria that would be found during a fecal contamination. Uh, the problem is that not all bacteria that grow at this temperature would actually come from a fecal source. Um, as the simple diagram here kind of shows, is that there are other bacteria that can grow at 44 and a half degrees. Uh, Klebsiella can be a bacteria that can occur from a fecal contamination. However, there are um, some species of Klebsiella that actually just naturally occur in the environment. So this wouldn't be a, the best source to say whether or not it's just fecal contamination. Uh, conversely, E. coli, while we know this only comes from fecal sources, there are some E. coli that just aren't able to survive at the elevated temperatures. So what we lose is we lose bacteria that definitely come from fecal contamination, and we could be including bacteria that are coming from the natural environment. So the term fecal coliform isn't exactly um, accurate. It's more of a thermal tolerant bacteria, um, bacteria that are able to survive at elevated temperatures. But from here on out, we'll still call them fecal coliforms because that's basically what everybody knows them as. So now that we know why we're looking for things and what we're looking for, the next thing is how do we look for them? Um, so there's been quite a change over the years as to how we test for uh, these indicator bacteria. Uh, so at the start, basically the, the first kind of test that we would have used would have been your multiple tube fermentation, or MTF. This is a process that requires um, some skill. Uh, it has up to 60 steps, so it's very labor intensive. And the results um, take some time uh, to get the final confirmed result. It takes up to four days in order to get your final answer. So it's not exactly the rapid test that we want to be able to use to look for uh, indicator bacteria for contamination. Uh, next, we come to membrane filtration. So definitely a, a step up from multiple tube. We do reduce the number of steps to run this test to about 20 steps for the test. And for the most part, the results are uh, out about 24 hours with confirmations um, with an additional 24 hours. So we're looking at a test that's about one to two days. So much quicker than multiple tube fermentation and simpler, but still requires some degree of skill um, to actually run this test. And then finally, we come to enzymatic tests. And this includes Colert, Colert 18, and EntraLert, where for quantification, the number of steps has been further reduced. So we're looking at up to eight total steps in order to run this test with confirmed results at 18 or 24 hours, depending on the test. So definitely a step up um, from memory infiltration 
and the amount of hands-on time and ease of use is uh, greatly improved over memory filtration and multiple tube fermentation. So with that, I'd like to go over a little bit on, on the three products we're going to talk about today. So Cold Alert, Cold Alert 18 are used for coliform testing, and NR Alert is for NR oxide testing. The way that all these tests work is very simple. Um, the reagent itself, the media, has basically three basic ingredients. Um, all of them have nutrients to support the growth of our target bacteria. All three of them have some kind of suppressant system to prevent um, our non-target bacteria from growing, so that way we, um, we increase our selectivity. And then finally, they all contain nutrient indicators, and these nutrient indicators are, will allow us to know if the indicator organism is present or not. So, for Colert and Colert 18, um, when being run for total coliform testing at 35 degrees, or for fecal coliform testing at 44 and a half with Colert 18, uh, we're looking at um, a nutrient indicator known as o nitrophenyl beta galactopyranoside or ONPG. And the basic way this works is that total coliforms, the coliform group, contain an enzyme, beta-galactosidase, and with this enzyme, they're able to utilize the nutrient indicator, ONPG. And so basically the enzyme eats the, the sugar group, the beta d galactopyranoside which then cleaves the bond to that o nitrophenyl group and releases the o nitrophenyl which hydrolyzes and becomes o nitrophenol So the media goes from colorless to yellow in the presence of coliforms. Now, Kohler and Kohler 18, run run at 35 degrees, um, can also be used to detect E. coli. So the media contains a second dairy indicator, known as 4-methylambipyrrole beta d um, or MUG, which specifically targets E. coli. So E. coli has both the beta-galactosidase enzyme and in addition to beta-glucuronidase. And so with this secondary enzyme, it is able to utilize this nutrient indicator, which does the same thing, basically eats that, that food group, releases that indicator, the uh, 4-MU, and then once it's re um, released, when it's exposed to uh, UV light, it will fluoresce. So we have two indicators in Kohler and Kohler 18, one to detect total coliforms, which includes E. coli, and a secondary one for E. coli. Now, uh, Entralert works on basically the same system. Uh, the nutrient indicator here is 4-MU beta-glucoside. Uh, Enercoxi have an enzyme glucosidase, which basically does the same thing, eats the group, sugar group, and releases the um, enzyme, which when exposed to UV light will fluoresce. So basically that's the science of how all of these tests work. So the next part is now we have a test, and how do we use it in order to quantify um, the results of our water samples? So basically you need to be able to have your water sample, the reagent, and then the quantity trace system. So the quantity trace system consists of the quantity trays, uh, quantity tray inserts, and the quantity tray sealer plus. So basically um, we have two different trays depending on what our counts will be, and I'll go a little bit about that um, later on, and then the sealer. So when running Kohler and Kohler 18, it's pretty simple. Basically, you just have your 100 ml water sample. You have the blister pack of the reagent, which you open and dispense the powder into your sample. After that, you mix to dissolve. Then you would pour your sample into your quine tray, and then add that to the insert, and then go through the sealer to seal. So basically the way this works is that the quine trays are, in a sense, there's two parts. There's a plastic front that actually has um, bubbles or wells, and then a backing that has a foil paper adhesive layer. And what we end up doing is basically just, uh, the quine tray acts like a bag at first where the sample goes in. And then as it goes through the sealer, through a combination of pressure and heat, it activates the adhesive on the foil backing, and it will disperse the sample amongst all the wells in the quine tray and seals them into individual wells. 
therefore giving us our quantification device. For Kohler and Code 18, the samples will then be incubated at 35 degrees plus or minus half a degree um, for testing of total coal form and E. coli. For Kohler, the test will incubate for 24 hours with results up to 28 hours being valid. And for Kohler 18, it'd be 18 hours up to 22 hours. So after adding the reagent, dissolving, adding to the quantity trays ceiling, they get incubated at 35 and then red at 24 or 18 hours, depending on the test. And this would be, once again, for total coal form and E. coli. After you take the trays out of the incubator, the next part is to read the results. And as mentioned before, basically we're looking for the two indicators. Um, the first one is the ONPG, so we're looking for that formation of yellow. Um, yellow color indicates a positive for total coliform. If you have any yellow wells, the next thing that you would do is then um, view under a 365 nanometer um, UV light, and then now you're looking for fluorescence. So any well that's yellow is a confirmed positive for total coliforms. Any yellow well that also fluoresces is considered a confirmed positive for E. coli. If looking at fecal coliform testing, uh, you would utilize Kohler 18, and it would be run the same way where you would add the reagent to the sample, mix the dissolve, seal in the tray. But the incubation would be done at 44 and a half degrees, plus or minus 0.2 degrees in a water bath. Now, the temperature for this test is extremely important. That 44 and a half degrees, plus or minus 0.2, is essential in order for this test to run correctly. Just uh, if you run it, uh, the temperature of the water bath is below 44.3, then the temperature is too low, and what could actually happen is you're allowing non-thermal tolerant bacteria to grow, which means that you could have higher numbers um, than would actually be expected. If the sample um, gets above 44.7, then the sample is actually getting too hot, which could actually kill off a lot of those thermal tolerant bacteria, which means you'd have lower numbers because um, you're basically killing off your target bacteria. So that plus or minus 0.2 degrees at um, around 44.5 is highly important and needs to be maintained. So the best way to do that is using a water bath. So with the quantity trays for a COVID-18, the trays would go directly into the water bath. They wouldn't be placed in a bag or any other container, just placed directly into the water. It's important that the trays remain beneath the surface of the water and so they should be weighed down with an appropriate weight. Um, as you can see in the picture here, there are those red rings. Those are weighted rings meant for water baths. What you don't want to do is use um, something from outside, say like a rock or a brick, because that would damage the tray. And you don't want to use like a beaker or a, a, anything filled with water um, to weigh them down, because that could actually mess a little bit with the thermodynamics, which could impact how the test performs. So you want to make sure that you use a weight that's appropriate in the water bath. And the important thing, again, is to make sure that the trays are completely submerged underneath the surface of the water. So after it's in the water bath, it's in the water bath for 18 hours, um, up to 22. And then from there, you remove the trays from the water bath. And what you're looking for is yellow color. The yellow color indicates positive, confirmed positive for fecal coliforms. Because as we mentioned before, um, we're not just looking for E. coli here. Fecal coliforms can include Klebsiella's and some other, uh, other genus in the coliform group. So we're just going to focus on the yellow color for fecal coliforms. With Kohler and Kohler 18, uh, we do have a comparator. The comparator is used when reading results. Um, basically, the comparator provides the minimal amount of yellow and fluorescence to call a, a sample positive. So in the case of reading your total coliform E. coli results, um, as long as the yellow is greater than or equal to the comparator, then it'd be considered a confirmed positive for coliforms. And then if you were to do that under the UV light, any fluorescence greater than or equal to the comparator with the yellow would also be considered an E. coli. So the comparator is good to have, um, especially when starting off with a test and for training new individuals or for any 
samples that might be questionable. Entry alert is run basically the same way as coal alert and coal routine. Um, basically, same thing, you just add the reagent to your sample, mix it dissolve, add to your tray. Uh, the difference here is that the tray is incubated at a different temperature. For entry alert, we, uh, the test is incubated at 41 degrees, plus or minus half a degree. Um, the results are valid from 24 to 28 hours. And once again, we're looking for that fluorescent signal. So any blue fluorescence um, when exposed to a UV light is considered positive for NRF oxide. All right. So now you have your trays. They've been incubated for the correct amount of time. And the next part is to count. So once again, depending on which test you're using, you count the number of positive wells. And then you refer to the most probable number table that's included with either tray type that is being used. So the NPN tables um, for the 51 well quine tray uh, will give you a counting range of up to 200. If you use the quine tray 2000, the NPN range is up to just over 2400. So it's good to, it's important to make sure that you use the right NPN table with the correct tray. So after you've counted your number of positive wells, you refer to the NPN table. Uh, here's an example for the 51 well. The first column is the number of positive wells that you, you have in your sample. The next column will tell you your most probable number of the NPN. So in the case of four positive wells, the NPN would be 4.2. For the client tray 2000, there are two different size wells on the tray. There's large wells, there's 49 of those, and there are 48 small wells. So each size well is counted separately. And then basically on the left-hand side of the MPN table, you'll find the number of large positive wells, and along the top, you'll have the number of small positive wells. And basically, you just trace from your numbers and to give you your final MPN. So in the case of um, 48 large wells and 25 small wells being positive, that would give you an MPN of 344.1. So one question that often comes up when customers um, are switching over from a memory filtration method or a, a plate method that gives them values in CFU um, is concerned about whether or not CFU and NPN are equivalent. So is there a difference between the two? And really, no, there is no difference. NPN and CFU are more of the label or the unit that's associated with the testing method. So in the case of MPN, or most probable number, uh, this would be any kind of bacteria that's being grown in a liquid medium. So for example, Kohler. CFU, colony forming units, um, are used for when the test is being run on a solid medium, such as an auger, or being used on a filter. So they both just refer to the count that you're receiving on the test. So MPN and CFU are dependent on the type of test that's being run as opposed to a difference in the actual value. Basically, both of them are reporting out on a value per 100 ml. It's just depending on which method you're using will depend on which uh, label you use. The important thing to point out is that there are 95% confidence limits built around both methods. A lot of people have um, the belief that when they count colonies on a plate, they're getting a true number, and there's no, there's no variability around that. Um, the, the truth is there is, because you could always lose some bacteria during the process. Um, memory filtration is kind of harsh on the bacteria, so some bacteria might not be able to recover. There's a bunch of different things that can go on. So even plate methods have a 95% confidence range. And if you were to look at the standard methods, they have an example of, of as such. Something else that comes up is whether or not dilutions can be done using our system. The advantage of the quantity tray system is that the counting range, depending on which tray you need to use, um, will actually give you quite a um, quite ease of use. And you get up to 2,400 on a quantity tray 2,000. So these dilutions actually go down. However, if you are using a tray and you have concerns that the sample might be um, have counts that are greater than the tray, uh, dilutions can be done. And dilutions are really simple to do. You just would take your, your, um, your sample and dilute it prior to adding the reagent. So 
you would do your dilution, add the reagent, and then continue on as you normally would to process the sample. When you read the results of your test, it's just important to make sure that you adjust your results based on uh, the dilution that you were done. So a couple of examples that are commonly done, uh, like a one-to-one -one dilution, where you'd have 50 mLs of sample and 50 mLs of diluent. Um, you just have to re read the results and then multiply the answer by two, and that would give you your final result for 100 mLs. And one to 10, once again, 10 mLs of sample with 90 mLs of diluent, you would just take your final result and multiply that by 10. Now a little bit into quality control. One of the advantages of uh, tests such as Kohler and Kohler 18 is that the batches um, are well controlled and the need for QC is a little more limited than what's needed for most um, MF methods. So example is Kohler 18 uh, versus MFC for fecal coliform testing. So with Kohler 18, basically, you need to run a positive and negative control when you first receive in a new batch of Kohler 18. Once you run that control, that's basically the last time you need to run a QC. So it's basically a one-time QC event, one to two samples uh, per batch. When it comes to MSC with the updated um, rules, you're now looking at uh, doing positive and negative controls for each batch that you make. Um, you're looking at verifying results of your tests. Uh, you also need to run blanks at the beginning and end of each sample run. And then on a monthly basis, there's now a requirement to verify 10 blue colonies um, from a sample to verify that your test is performing correctly and that results are being done right. So as you can see, the amount of QC that's being done between methods is also greatly reduced when switching to an enzymatic method like Colid 18. When it comes to QCing for um, COVID-18, you want to look at using uh, bacteria that comes from a natural collection. So this include such as um, such things as ATCC um, or NCTC. And these groups will be able to provide bacteria um, that's controlled. Uh, we also offer uh, through IDEX a QC product, IDEX QC, which will contain positive and negative controls for the different media that you'd be running. So for instance, if you're running Colert and Colert 18 for total coliforms and E. coli, uh, we ha have a, a kit that contains um, three vials of E. coli, uh, three Klebsiella varicola, which would be your uh, coliform positive, and Pseudomonas originosa as a non-target, so uh, your negative control. And we also have that for the other two products. So we have one for fecal coliforms, where it would have uh, E. coli and Pseudomonas originosa, and the enterococci kit, which will give you uh, enterococcus fecalis as your positive control, and then a gram-negative bacteria, E. coli, and a gram-positive strep bovis as uh, negative controls for that product. One thing that we strive at at IDEX is the quality of our products. So it's important that um, that information is carried through to our customers. And so it's, uh, the, the certificates of analysis for all of our products um, are available. Um, it's good to have uh, a copy of that for your own records. Um, so that way you have that available um, for yourselves and for any audits that might occur. All of the uh, CFAs can be obtained from our website. And in the presentation, there is a hyperlink that will take you directly to that page. Basically, you click on that, um, that link or go through idex.com backslash water, and there will be a link for certificates of analysis. When you click on that link, um, it will bring up a field where you can type in the lot number of the product that you're using. When you go through that um, and add that, it will come up with all the products that have that lot number. And then you click on the product that you're using, and a PDF version of the certificate of analysis will come up. And then basically from there you can just print it off and have it in your system. The C of A's for the products will indicate all the different tests that are performed for that specific batch and lot of materials. So what's important is it will have the different tests and say whether or not they passed. Um, the truth is that we would not release product unless it passes our 
quality control. So you always see pass. Basically, um, when our production uh, makes any of, uh, of the materials, they collect samples from across the lot, and then that set of product goes to our quality control lab. Um, from there, they'll run their battery of tests to ensure that the test is working correctly. Once all of that is done, um, all that information then gets sent to our quality assurance team. And then quality assurance will then go through and make sure that all the testing has been done, has been done correctly, and that it, the product is good to go. Only once it's approved by QA will the product and lot be released for distribution. So we have several checks in place to make sure that when we release products, we're releasing as high as quality as possible. And to further stress the IDEX's um, commitment to quality, uh, we do have several different ISO certifications, including 9001 and 14001 as a company. Uh, the Water QC Lab has an additional ISO certification for 17025. And basically, on a yearly basis, we're audited to ensure that our QC group is doing uh, testing um, correctly and that it's up to uh, the highest degree we can. So most of our uh, reagents fall under 17025. And not so much in the States, but in um, other countries, it, this actually just kind of helps those labs um, verify with their QC testing. So um, just a quick slide to show that we have CFAs available for all of our products, whether it be our reagents like Kohler and Kohler 18, or the quine trays, our vessels, the IDEX QC. All of our products will have an associated certificate of analysis that can be uh, downloaded and kept for your records for all of our products. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Sean. Um, that was a lot of great information. And, and just as a reminder, if you do have a question for Sean um, or for Jody as um, she begins her presentation, uh, please let us know. There is a Q&A tool on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Uh, please type your question in there, and then we will get to your questions um, when Jody is finished with the regulatory portion of the presentation, which will begin now. So welcome, Jody. Thank you, Nancy. Hello, everyone. So the US EPA uh, drives regulations in Arkansas just like it does for all other states. Uh, specifically in the EPA's Clean Water Act is where it states what the wastewater regulations are, which can be found in the Code of Federal Regulations at 40 CFR Part 136. And every so often these regulations are updated through a process called uh, the Method Update Rule. The most recent method update rule was done by the EPA in August of 2017, which this included the EPA's final approval of IDEX's Kohler 18 fecal pool for method for wastewater effluent testing. After the EPA had its method update rule in 2017, states that have primacy can either incorporate the federal rules into the state rules, or the state can create rules that are equivalent to the federal rule, but if the state creates its own rule, it must be as stringent as the federal, it can't be less stringent. So wastewater regulations in Arkansas are included under regulation number six. This regulation requires fecal cold form as the bacteria parameter for monitoring, which is enforced through the State Pollution Discharge Elimination System Permit Program, which is referenced as NPDES. And Arkansas NPDES permitting rules are included within Chapter 34. And just to quickly mention, there are a couple hyperlinks in a few of these presentation slides. So once the presentation is available, you can view the content connected to each hyperlink if you like. Uh, for example, the regulations here if you wanted to review um, the rule language. So requirements for analytical test methods for NPDES testing must be compliant with the EPA rules, specifically those listed at the 40 CFR Part 136. However, it is possible that some wastewater permits might list a specific method instead of including the general uh, reference of allowing any test method included at 40 CFR 136. So if you ever had a question on an NPDES permit, um, perhaps the language or if there was a specific method included, it's always best 
to reach out to the permit writer that's included on the individual permit. Um, if you are unsure who the permit writer is, you could certainly reach out to the permit supervisor listed here. The Arkansas Department of Environmental Quality Water Permit Branch is responsible for managing the permitting process. This department reviews permit applications, conducts on-set um, inspections, and makes sure facilities are compliant with the MPDES permit in wastewater discharging. Additionally, they, they'll, they will, they'll respond to um, reports of environmental damage, they'll do enforcement type activities, and they'll also answer any questions. Um, there's a hyperlink here if you'd like to contact the MPDES permit program. So once the EPA has adopted the method update rule, this change affects wastewater labs in Arkansas by allowing more analytical test methods that can be used for MPDES permit fecal coal form monitoring requirements. Um, this revision can be really helpful to laboratories, as since previously mentioned by Sean, Kohler 18 reduces the quality control steps, also reduces hands-on time makes demonstration of capability easier for both a new analyst and for any ongoing DOCs that might need to be continuously done over time, and also allows for more reliable data. So you might be wondering now if a laboratory is interested in changing an analytical test method, how can that be done? In Arkansas, under the State Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program Act, wastewater facilities that have in-house laboratories are not required to be accredited through the accreditation program. Only commercial and private laboratories that submit test results to the Arkansas Department of Environmental Quality are required to be accredited. So, however, it's still good practice for those laboratories that are not required to obtain accreditation to conduct some sort of method verification when adopting a new test method. So some of those steps might include, for example, conducting a parallel study between the new and the existing method, possibly doing a seven to 10 split sample comparison. Um, you would also wanna think about writing a standard operating procedure for the new method. Um, if you have a laboratory quality assurance manual, it would be good to review it and make any updates that might be necessary. Um, you'd also want to review and verify if there were are, um, any DMRQA study requirements. For laboratories that are accredited, you'll want to follow the Environmental Laboratory Certification Program requirements for adding a new method. And here at IDEX, we've put together these steps listed here um, in a method adoption guide document for Kohler 18 specifically for fecal cold form testing. And this document will walk you through these steps that will need to be completed uh, for adopting the method, and the document is available by request. So typically, the steps to adding a new method will include passing two proficiency tests, creating a standard operating procedure for the Kohler 18 fecal cold form method, and additionally, as part of as part of the SOP, you'll want to include the quality control requirements which are listed within the Kohler 18 package. Um, when you're writing your SOP, if you felt like you needed some help with creating one, here at IDEX we also have an example SOP document that is available by request. Other steps for adding a method to your scope, you'll want to make sure to um, make any changes to your quality system manual, especially if you don't already have IDEX listed as a vendor. You'll want each analyst to complete a demonstration of capability, document it, then retain the information, and have it available if the state ever requested to view it. You'll want to complete the appropriate application forms and pay any associated fees. Then once all those steps have been completed, the laboratory might be subject to an on-site audit. If there are any findings or corrective actions identified from the audit, those would need to be completed, then sent into the assessor. Once, that all, once all that information is complete, it would be sent into the state to review, and then if granted, the method would be added to the uh, lab scope of accreditation. For certification program questions, uh, there's a contact listed here, the Quality Assurance 
officer. So today I talked a little bit about um, Arkansas regulations and just to wrap up today's regulatory portion, I'd like to share a part of what I do, uh, which is I follow various state rules and regulations to see how they periodically change over time. Um, I'd like to provide just a little bit of information on how easy it is for anyone to follow and even participate in Arkansas rule changes. Since anyone from the public can comment on proposed rule changes and comments can be quite impactful to rule makers, especially when they come from stakeholders such as wastewater utility folks or laboratories, especially since you're the ones that do this type of work and you might be directly affected by any of the rule changes. A comment submitted to the state can include things like your opinion on the rule subject, any data you'd like to share that might be impactful pertaining to the regulation you're commenting on, or how the proposed rule change might impact your daily work. Typically, the comment phases are open for about 30 to 60 days, uh, but you can sign up to receive email notifications on various rulemaking activities so you can watch and track what's happening in your state. Um, on this slide, you can click on the hyperlink if you'd like to sign up to follow various activities in your state. The link will bring you to a page that looks like the content listed here, um, and you can choose which regulations you'd like to subscribe to and follow. This particular um, picture snippet contains to or pertains to the Office of Water Quality. Um, there certainly are other offices um, if you had interest in following uh, regulations in other departments as well. And that concludes the regulatory portion. Great. Thank you so much, Jody. Um, we are going to move over to some questions, um, but first, just as a reminder, you can type in your questions in the Q&A um, field in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, type in your question and um, either address it to Sean or Jody, or we'll figure out which one you, you are um, addressing it to. Um, so for the first question, uh, this question actually is for you, Jody. Um, what do I do if my permit states a specific test method? Yeah, good question. So if the permit lists a specific method, um, it's best to reach out to the permit writer listed on the individual permit then you can ask what needs to be done to have the method changed. Um, if you're unsure who to contact, um, there was a link on one of the slides to a contact that they could reach out to. All right, great. And um, also, just as a reminder, um, this webinar is being recorded, and I will be sending out um, the link to the recording when it becomes available, as well as um, a copy of the slides. And as Jody mentioned, all of the links um, that she has so helpfully put into the presentation, you'll be able to link through to access the specific information for your state um, once I send out the presentation. Um, okay, Sean, question for you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, is there a comparator available for enter alert? And if there is, or I'm sorry, compar comparator available for enter alert, but also, is there a different comparator for Colert and Colert 18? So for Colert and Colert 18, it's actually the same comparator. So there's only one comparator that could be used for both products. And that also includes for um, using Colert 18 as a fecal coliform test. The comparator is used for the minimal amount of yellow, depending on the test, and the fluorescence if you're using it for E. coli. For Enterler, there is no comparator available. We only have comparators for Colert and Colert 18. Um, for Enter Alert, if there were any kind of question on whether or not something is positive, once again, you're just looking for any blue fluorescence. But there's a question, then you can just run a, a blank, um, a negative um, a sterile sample um, with uh, Enter Alert, and then just compare it to that. Um, OK, so there is no separate comparator for um, fluorescing E. coli. There is. James. Yep, it's the same comparator. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Jody, for a uh, question for Jody. Um, does a commercial lab need to add Colert 18 fecal coliform to their accreditation scope? Yes, good question. So if the test results are being used for any compliance testing, then yes, the commercial or private lab would need to add the new method to the lab scope of accreditation. All right, great. Thank you. Um, Sean, like a tennis match. Uh, Sean, 
I don't have a water bath. Is it okay if I use an air incubator? So if this question is referring to fecal coliform testing, um, well, we highly suggest using only a water bath for fecal coliform testing. That, once again, that plus or minus 0.2 around that 44 and a half is really important. So a water bath is able to maintain that tight temperature tolerance a lot better than an air incubator can. There are some air incubators um, that can do that, but they're usually really expensive and they're still questionable. So the best thing to do for fecal coliform testing is using a water bath. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Another question for you, um, Sean. Can I test a sample which has um, some coloration, turbidity, or sediment? Uh, yep, yeah, you can still test a sample of has coloration um, or any kind of turbidity. So the question is if that coloration would make it difficult to read a yellow result if you're using this for you know, coliforms or uh, fecal coliform then you can definitely do something uh, like just do a, a dilution, um, a low enough dilution, uh, which should take care of any kind of coloration or turbidity that would interfere with the test. All right, thank you. Uh, Judy, um, you mentioned that IDEX has a method adoption guide. How can I get a copy? Yes, we do have a document that outlines the steps for adopting the Kohler 18 fecal coliform method that is specific to your state which is available by request, so you can just email us or give us a call. So if somebody wanted that, they could email water at idex.com? Correct. Yes. Okay, and that goes for the um, sample SOP as well? Yes, okay. absolutely. So if you'd like to get a copy of that, uh, either the method adoption guide or a sample SOP, please send us an email at uh, water at idex.com. All right, thank you, Jody. Um, Sean. Is there a difference in the reagent between Kohler and Kohler 18? So there's a, a formulation difference, and that difference is what allows Kohler 18 to be read um, at an earlier time point. So the results are valid at 18 as opposed to 24 for Kohler. But other than that, they perform the same. And what about, is there a different uh, Kohler 18 reagent for fecal coliform testing versus E. coli testing? Uh, nope, once again, it's the same reagent. The only difference is the temperature that you incubate it at. So Kohler 18 is used for both tests. It's just depending on which temperature you incubate it at will be for the different tests. All right, great, thanks. And it looks like we only have one more question, and it's for Sean. Um, is it acceptable to make a dilution of the wastewater sample? Yeah, as mentioned in the presentation, um, if for any reason you feel that the results will be uh, greater than the counting range of the tray, then the dilution would be um, more than acceptable to do. All right, great, thank you. Thank you both, um, Sean and Jody, for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, we really appreciate your time, and we appreciate the time of those of you um, who were able to join us this afternoon. Um, look for, I will be sending out the link to the recorded webinar along with the slides. Uh, look for it in your inbox in the next couple of days. Uh, but if you do have additional questions or any feedback, or if you are watching this as an on-demand viewer and do have some questions, um, please feel free to contact us at water at idex.com. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.